Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going to be, but let's stop in chapter 1. And I'm very thankful for Colin and the work that he does, and he does it every Sunday, but it's so obvious when I'm preaching how he sets people up, because we're going to talk about the rock, we're going to talk about the foundation, and we're going to talk about the reality that we cannot be shaken. So, as we consider Hebrews, and we look at our text, I was thinking about growing up a little bit, and we moved a lot growing up, in fact, probably more than every couple of years, and so every time we moved, what my parents did was made sure that I had some way to get back home. So I'm nine years old, we moved to Costa Rica, and I knew that we lived two blocks away from Parque del Bosque, which means I had to get in a taxi, tell them to take me to the park. If something happened, I could get home. Then we moved to Maracay, and it was a little bit different. We lived in a neighborhood called El Limon. You could get on a bus, watch for the little convenience store, pull the rope, get off at the convenience store, two blocks away, that's where the house is. And then, of course, on to Caracas, which was a much bigger city. It was a little bit more complex, but we memorized our phone number with a little song. It was 9634379. Living in Caracas is very fine. Now, there was no cell phone, so I had to go find a payphone, which if you've never seen a payphone, if you're too young for that, they just had these phones on the street corners. You'd go, you'd have to put your card in because their money wasn't worth anything, and I'd be able to call home. So my parents always made sure that we knew where home was. And when we get to the end of chapter 12 here in Hebrews, this is the author's final plea to a people who seem to be vacillating back and forth between either staying the Christian course or returning to a defunct Judaism. So he's bringing them before a mirror and he's asking them to reflect. He's saying, you know where you live. You know where you belong. And in case you're wondering, let me remind you where you came from and how much greater it is here than where you used to live. They're being tempted. If you look through the book of Hebrews, they're being tempted to abandon the gospel of Jesus Christ, to go back to the old ways, which ironically we're all pointing to whom? To Jesus Christ. So look at chapter 1 for just a second, verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purifications of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. So right out of the gate at the beginning of Hebrews, The author is telling us that Jesus is the final message of God. He is the greatest message that God has ever spoken. Everything you ever need will be found in him. And as you move through the book, the inspired writer tells us that Jesus is greater than the prophets. Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Joshua, Aaron, sacrifices. Jesus is greater than every other thing. And the author is concerned that these readers would fail to hear that message, that Jesus was the only way to the Father. Listen to Hebrews 3, verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. We'll talk about what provoked him in a moment. But there are many warnings like this throughout the book. There was a real concern by the author that some would fall away. And why would they? 
Why would they be tempted to fall away? Well, the journey has become difficult. The race is getting tough. The recipients of the letter seem to be former Jews, and those that they had left behind were not too happy about it. The Jews attacked them. They were publicly humiliated. They were stolen from. They were imprisoned. And it's because of these trials that some were contemplating returning to the old ways and turning a deaf ear to the gospel message. Hebrew says, don't do it. Listen to the gospel message. Believe the gospel message and cling to the gospel message. Do not forsake Jesus. So on to chapter 12. Look at verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 25. Do not forsake Jesus. Verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. The readers of the letter had come to a point of decision. And all those who hear the gospel message come to a point of decision. And the text is clear. If we are covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are no longer terrorized by the law, but we rejoice in the new covenant. Our hope is not in obedience, our obedience. Our hope is in his obedience. So chapter 12, verse 18, let's read it together. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they cannot bear the command, even if a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Father, I pray that you help us this morning, that your word may work in our heart so that we might rejoice in you more completely and serve you more truly. In Jesus' name, amen. So four considerations in our text this morning four considerations, and the first one is consider Sinai. Consider Sinai, verses 18 through 21. It's so helpful to me that verse 18 starts with, you have not come to. You have not come to. So there's a clear contrast to the new covenant saint and those who had come to Sinai. I'm grateful for this reminder because as you work through chapter 12, you see so many exhortations. In verse 1, you see that we're to lay aside sin, we're to run with endurance. Then in verse 5, you see, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. We should not faint. In verse 12, we're to strengthen the weak and the feeble. In verse 13, make straight paths for your feet. Verse 14, pursue peace. 
15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up. Verse 16, that there be no godless person among you. And this is similar to many texts, but if you're not careful, the list of exhortations becomes your new religion. It's a list of commands that we must carry out to earn the favor of God, and that's not the message at all. Look at verse 2 of chapter 12. What are we to do? We're to fix our eyes on Jesus. And who is Jesus? He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is our mediator. He is our justifier. Romans 8, verse 3, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we don't read these as a list of commandments in order to fulfill the law. Christ fulfilled the law. It is fulfilled in him. So back to Hebrews, verse 18. You've not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard it begged no further word be spoken to them. So these verses are recalling for the readers the scene that we find in Exodus 19 where God enters into covenant with Israel. And this is the terms in a nutshell. There are some things that you should do, and there are some things that you shall not do. Failure to obey perfectly all these commands brings what? Brings exile. You're not going to keep the land. You do what I say, you keep the land. You don't do what I say, you're going to be exiled. So to make sure that the people, the Israelites, understood the seriousness of the covenant, God descended upon Mount Sinai in a terrifying fashion. We have time. Turn, turn over to Exodus 19 for just a second and listen as you're turning there. Moses goes upon the mountain. God offers the covenant to Moses. Moses then goes and says, here's the message to the elders. Here's what God's terms are. And then when you get to verse 8, you see that the elders say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So there's agreement. They're going to do what they've been called to do. Moses takes the answer back to God, and God says, behold, I'm going to come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. So Moses is is, uh, to instruct the people to uh, consecrate themselves for two days, and on the third day, God's going to show up and speak. This was a serious event. So look at verse 16 in chapter 19. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. The Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so, they, so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. So in chapter 20, we get the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, They're delivered, and God's message is so intense that the people actually respond in fear. There's fear. Look at chapter 20 of Exodus, 18 through 21. 
All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Listen to this. Lock this verse in your mind. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. The people stood at a distance. They could not approach. They would not approach. They were fearful. This was a terrifying event, and it certainly had its impact on Moses because later on you'll see the people sin, and Moses falls upon his face for 40 days and nights before God and says, don't wipe them out. Moses understood the ramifications of the law. So what does Moses do? Time and time again, he warns the people, do not sin. Do not sin. Do not forsake God. And sadly, it ended time after time in judgment and condemnation. The generation that saw this at the mountain didn't enter the promised land. They don't enter into the rest. They die in the wilderness. Then we get to the book of Judges. And what is the book of Judges about? Having to raise up judges to deliver his people because they disobey. Ultimately, Assyria, and then Babylon, God uses to utterly destroy and deport Israel out of the land altogether. So what does the covenant at Sinai promise? It promised judgment, and it delivered judgment. Two, two implications before we move on. It's important for us to be reminded what we know about the law of God. Listen carefully. Galatians 3, verse 19. Why the law then? It was added because of the transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a a mediator is not for one party only, where God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based upon the law. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. What does the law do? The law reveals to us how truly sinful we are. It is the tutor that leads us to Christ. One commentator said that the route to Zion has to go through Sinai where we encounter the terrors of falling short of God's law. So the first implication here is that God's law should instill in us a fear of his holiness and judgment. Back to our text in Hebrews, verse 19. And to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. They were scared. They saw the holiness of God, and they saw their own inability to face him. John Calvin opens his institutes with this profound sentence that nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. Still, Calvin, each of us must then be so stung by the consciousness of his own unhappiness as to obtain at least some knowledge of God. That means that we have to see our own failure. 
obviously, the knowledge revealed to us in Scripture that we have to see the extent of our own ills, our own sickness, to contemplate the good things of God. We cannot seriously aspire to Him before we begin to become displeased with ourselves. Guess what? The Israelites were displeased with themselves because they knew they were unworthy. Calvin goes on later to to show that the only way we get a clear knowledge of ourselves is to look upon God's face. His holiness reveals our pride. His holiness reveals our self-righteousness, our hypocrisy, our sin. And until we have an understanding as, of God as revealed in Scripture, we're going to flatter ourselves. We're going to think we're not all that bad. Yet the more we understand of God, the more we recognize our sinfulness. And it is that realization that drives us to the cross. At the cross, our sense of impending judgment, of impending doom, is removed. But just because that is removed doesn't mean we don't still maintain a sense of awe and reverence in the presence of a holy God. Amazing grace, you know the hymn well, the second verse. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to what? To fear. Then what? And grace my fears relieved. Grace shows us God but it also delivers us from the fear of God because he's made a way. So by grace, we see our own wickedness and powerlessness. We see the judgment we deserve, but it is also by grace that we are called to turn to Jesus Christ. The law instills in us the understanding of how holy God is. So the second implication should be clear, right? God's law reveals to us a need for his mediator. At Mount Sinai, who went up? Moses and Aaron. Nobody else. But these men had sin of their own. Jesus Christ is our true, sinless high priest. Who did what? Who offered himself as our sacrifice. He brings us into the city of the living God, the heavenly Zion. So the author of Hebrews is saying, why go back to Sinai when you have Zion? And as we think of Sinai, we're reminded that failure brings judgment. And we should see clearly that we've all failed. But we only consider Sinai as a reminder of how glorious the mercies of the new covenant truly are. Number two, we considered Zion, now let's, or considered Sinai, now we rejoice in Zion. Verses 22 through 24. So here in verse 22, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. You have come to Mount Zion. Okay, there's a clear contrast to Sinai. You have not come there, saints, but you have come here. This is your home. Remember that this is your home. And this coming to Zion carries the weight of a professed commitment. Okay, Hebrew readers, you have come here because you have professed faith in Jesus Christ. So what do we learn about Zion? Six benefits of Zion over Sinai. First benefit, this mountain is heavenly. Zion is the name of the mountain where David first set the ark of God. Solomon builds his temple on Mount Moriah, and when the ark is moved there, Zion becomes the name of the entire area. So when you think of Zion, or when the Israelites think about Zion, we should be equating it with the presence of God. And it is here that the writer says, this is the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So you see the first distinction. Sinai was physical. And an earthly mountain, Zion Zion is a spiritual and a heavenly one. The overall feel of these verses in stark contrast to the preceding verses. Remember, the Israelites would not approach this mountain. But here in Zion, we have joy and inclusion. You have come to the city of the living God. 
And Hebrews mentions this city more than any other New Testament book. This is the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. It's the city that God prepared for the Old Testament saints who died in faith without receiving the promise. And while we now dwell in it spiritually, there is a sense that this city is still yet to come. City conveys a sense of orderliness, a security against the enemy. It's a place where needs for food and water are met and where fellowship is enjoyed with others. But this isn't just any city. It's the city of the living God. Hebrews 3.12, the author warned, Take care, brethren, that there not be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. In chapter 9, verse 14, he wrote that the blood of Christ would uh, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So as opposed to Sinai, ritualistic, legalistic, through Christ we enter into an abiding relationship with the living God. That's the first distinction. The second distinction is you're going to see in verse 22, the end. This is where the true assembly gathers. And to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly, and to and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That is to say, the true people of God dwell on this mountain. The writer says it's not those who are at Sinai who are the true congregation. It is those who are at Zion. This is where the angelic choir gathers to worship. This is where the real general assembly meets. This is where the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven gather. So what we are talking about is this is where the real church meets, the real congregation of God. They no longer gather around Sinai. And the true congregation of God is the church who is already enrolled in heaven. We're enrolled in heaven now. Number three, God actually lives there. Look at verse 23. And to God, judge of all, you have come to God at Sinai. Number four, with God we see the saints of old and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. These spirits are the saints of old, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Daniel, so on. They don't dwell in Sinai. They dwell in Zion. They did not come to God through the works of the law. They came to God through faith. Even the Old Testament saints are saved by faith. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11, and it's listing all these men and women and what made them great their faith. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, Enoch did that. By faith, Noah, Abraham, Sarah. By faith, by faith, by faith. And it is by this faith that we will gather alongside them in the true assembly. What else do we see about Zion? Well, this is where the mediator dwells. Verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Remember, this is the thesis of the book of Hebrews, how Jesus is the great and final high priest. What did he do? He actually entered into the presence of God. He actually atoned for the sin of his people. He actually finished his work and now sits at the right hand of the Father, and one who daily intercedes on our behalf. He's the one who brought in the new covenant accomplished by the grace of God. He is in Zion. And we are with him. The final benefit that you see at verse 24, Zion is where true atonement occurs. And to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Listen to this. If you, if you remember when Abel was murdered, that God said Abel's blood cried out to him from the ground. Abel's blood got God's attention. And here, we're told that this blood speaks better than his. It is the blood of Christ which brings perfect and total forgiveness of sins. It's not temporary. It's not partial. It's not symbolic. What Christ did on the cross in shedding his blood brought perfect 
atonement and forgiveness. What do we see in the old covenant? Numerous goats, numerous bulls, blood being shed over and over and over and over again, and it never produced forgiveness. That's what the text tells us. But Jesus did. Listen to Hebrews 10, verse 11. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So consider the contrast again. Sinai said, obey these commands and you can stay in the land. At Zion, we hear something else. We hear, I will make you holy. I will fulfill the law. And then what? And then you can dwell with me. You don't have to stand at a distance anymore. There's no more separation. You dwell with me. One commentary said that Zion, or Sinai, could be touched. It was a physical mountain, but they couldn't approach it. Zion can't be touched. It's spiritual, but it can be approached. We can enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus. He has made a new way, and he has called us to draw near to him. We have access to God through him. At Sinai, what was demanded? A veil being placed between the people and the holy of holies. From Zion, Jesus Christ says, come to me. Draw near to me. I have made the way. Come be a part of the heavenly assembly. Zion is better in every single way. So those standing at Sinai had a decision to make. Obey this law and be blessed by God. Disobey and receive destruction. All who hear the gospel message have a similar choice. All who hear the gospel are standing before Zion and have a similar choice. God is speaking. He's speaking through his word. Listen to John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten of God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained him. So what's the message of God that you're hearing today? Is that Jesus is the final message. Man has sinned sinned and offended God in every way. You have sinned and offended God in every possible way. And yet he has made provision. Isaiah 53. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. So what's the answer provided? Jesus bore our sins on the cross. He paid the debt that we could not pay. And the message of God is simple. You trust in him. You trust in him. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's intention for your life is that you turn from your sin. See that Jesus is the only means of forgiveness before God. Believe in him and submit your life totally to Jesus Christ. That's the message. You, just like them, are now standing before God's mountain. 
You hear the gospel. You're standing before the mountain of God. You're listening to God's terms and requirements. You have a decision to make. So we consider Sinai. We rejoice in Zion. Number three, be warned of the consequences. Look at verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. That is God. It is him who convicts you of your sin. Look back at the text. For those did not escape. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less until, or much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Okay, so the first hymn in that verse is Moses. He warned the Israelites on earth. And when they didn't listen to Moses, what happened? Did they escape judgment? Of course not. Here the text is saying if they didn't escape, when they didn't listen, you're not going to escape. Why? Because the message is coming directly from heaven. This message, the word of God, Jesus Christ, comes directly from heaven. And what's the warning? Verse 26. And his voice shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. So what's God's warning? What is he warning us in the text? He's warning that judgment is coming. He's warning that judgment is coming. Second Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise... We are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Sinai was a small picture of what God is going to do to the entire world one day. Judgment is warned, or judgment is coming, and God is warned. And it's a judgment far greater than what they saw at Sinai. God's going to shake this world, and what's going to be left? That which is unshakable that which is perfectly righteous and acceptable. It reminds us of Jesus' story about the man who built his house on the rock. The storm comes, and is it shaken? No, it survives the storm. The man who built his house on on the sand, wiped out, destroyed. If you aren't in him, you will not survive that storm. See, there's a choice to be made. At Sinai, God offered obedience or judgment. At Zion, he offers his righteousness and his grace or judgment. Finally, how do we respond? Verse 28 through 29, this is number four. We serve God in gratitude. Serve God in gratitude. Since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, that's verse 28. If you are in Christ Jesus, you're safe. You cannot be shaken. You cannot lose your eternal security in him. So if that's true, what do we do? Look at the text. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. We've received that which we don't deserve We receive that which we could never earn. And because of that, our lives should be overflowing with deep and sincere gratitude. We should display this gratitude with an offering to God. And there's only one thing that you can offer to God. Service with reverence and awe. Reverence and awe before His holiness. We are called to present our lives, our bodies, our souls, our futures, our plans, our resources, our time, everything to God. God gives us Christ, and we give ourselves to God through Christ. And why should we? Verse 29, 
For our God is a consuming fire. If you're not in Christ, that should chill you to the core. God is going to judge, and he is going to judge fairly and rightly. Fire is a symbol of judgment. Hebrews 10, 26-27 For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expe- expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Our God judges those who refuse Him. Our God will judge His enemies. Look at Sinai. So there's Hebrews chapter 12. And it should be clear to us that Jesus is better. He is the greatest offer. And the picture that's been painted for us should be resonating in our mind. Where do you want to live? Where is your hope? Remember your God. At Sinai, there's distance between the people and God. In Zion, we're welcomed into the presence of God Almighty. At Sinai, there's terror at the law of God. In Zion, the man made righteous loves the law of God. At Sinai, endless blood of bulls and goats was spilled. At Zion, the blood of Christ has exhausted the wrath of God for his people. At Sinai, darkness and gloom abounded. In Zion, God dwells and God is light. At Sinai, Moses and the people trembled. And in Zion, those who live there will never be shaken again. Praise God for the gift of His Son, the spotless Lamb of God. If you've never called out to Jesus Christ in sorrow of your sin and in need of salvation because you see the law and you understand that you can't uphold the law, the choice is clear. You cannot turn to yourself. You cannot try harder. You cannot look inwardly. We have to look to Him. And He turns away none that seek Him in truth. If you've tried to do this church thing for a long time, hoping that your own efforts will be enough, hoping that one day this is just going to click for you and you're going to feel good about it, listen, your work could never end and it still would not be enough. You could live forever and work and it not be enough. It would never finish. And yet Jesus says at the cross, what? It is finished. Perfect atonement accomplished. The perfect lamb says, come to me and find rest. Turn to Jesus and live. Because a day is coming where all who are not secure in him are going to be shaken. Judgment is coming. And that's not an opinion. That's what the text tells us. So do not refuse him who is speaking. Do not reject God's last word, Jesus Christ. And dear church, if you are in Christ, what do we do? We rejoice in the great privileges that we've been given as part of the true heavenly assembly that's gathered on his holy mountain. We rejoice in him. We love his law because we love him. We have peace in him. And in love and joy and the peace of Christ, you will live a life of acceptable service to your Lord and Savior. Praise God, that's a gift. Father, we thank you for providing the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for making a way for sinful men to join you forever in Zion. I pray for those who do not believe in your Son that you would open their eyes, that you would crush their pride to see the truth of the way that you've made. And for your people here at our church, Father, remind us of the peace that we have in you. And thank you, Father, for allowing us to live a life of service in that peace. In Jesus' name, amen.